majority still rules in Ohio. The ex-president was at the center of that multifaceted plot to overturn the election. Are you prepared to declare a national emergency with respect to climate change? We've already done that. Hello, I'm Caitlin Huey Burns in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. Newly unsealed court records show special counsel Jack Smith's team obtained a search warrant for former President Trump's Twitter account earlier this year. The filings show a judge later gave the platform, now known as X, a $350,000 fine for missing the deadline to comply. A legal battle has played out regarding the warrant behind closed doors for months. For more on this, senior legal affairs reporter for Politico, Kyle Cheney, joins us now. Kyle, good to see you. Thanks for being here. So what kind of information were prosecutors looking for from the account? So we don't actually know that. There's not a lot of details about what they wanted, but what we can discern, I mean, what they would theoretically get from a search warrant of Donald Trump's Twitter account is, number one, probably where the account would be used, so IP address. So was it, was it Donald Trump himself personally sending tweets, for example, when he told his supporters to come to Washington for a wild protest? Or could it have been an aide, an, an advisor who had access to the account? And that may be necessary to determine, was it Donald Trump himself sending out these messages, or, or could it have been somebody else? And, and do you have any idea about why the court didn't disclose the warrant earlier? Sure. So this is all happening in the context of, you know, secret grand jury investigation. Uh, this was, again, the, the warrant was issued in January. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the judge determining there's probable cause to, to think that there was a crime was committed and that evidence of that crime could be found on, in Donald Trump's Twitter account. They don't want to tip off Donald Trump, they don't want to tip off anybody else who might be part of this investigation that this warrant's been issued uh, and, and potentially encourage them to hide evidence or change their behavior or whatever. That's a standard criminal investigation tactic. So uh, they didn't want this information coming out uh, sooner than it had to. And, and while I have you, I want to ask about this new memo that we've been learning about today. It essentially lays out Trump's strategy for trying to overturn the 2020 election. Um, what more can you tell us about this? Sure. So actually, the, uh, the, this is part of a series of memos uh, by one of the attorneys who's listed as a co-conspirator in the indictment, Kenneth Cheesebro, uh, and, and he sort of laid out the intellectual framework for arguing that these false electors should be meeting in state capitals on December 14th, 2020, that uh, Mike Pence should be to declare his authority to overturn the election single-handedly. Uh, and what you see in these memos, and including the new one that was that was released, um, is how he turned it from this is just a safeguard, a backup plan if, in case we win any court battles. To let's do this to put the pressure on Pence to actually create a reason for Congress to challenge the results. Uh, and here's the plan for putting this in action. So it became a theory to an action plan to a secret a plan to pressure Pence essentially. And a plan put on paper, no less. Um, Kyle Cheney, thank you so much for your time and reporting. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Voters in Ohio have rejected a proposal that would have made it more difficult to change the state's constitution. Abortion rights supporters are celebrating the outcome of that vote, and that's because there's a ballot question on enshrining reproductive rights in the Ohio constitution in November. So for more on this, Finn Gomez joins us now, friend of the program. He's also CBS News political director. Finn, good to see you. Um, so this Ohio vote we've been covering for a while now, um, and I know it was kind of nuanced, but essentially this was sending a huge message across the country uh, that even in a conservative state like Ohio, um, this is an issue that is mobilizing voters. And I'm curious, you know, from your reporting and from what we've seen throughout this year, you know, this seems to send a message to Republican voters that this is a real potent issue in politics. Yeah, and it's still galvanizing uh, forces uh, against the uh, even in these, like you mentioned, like in, even in your own reporting, of course, in these in these Republican strongholds like Ohio that has become increasingly a red mm -hmm. state. And mm -hmm. when you're seeing this uh, uh, this uh, this alliance of uh, progressives, of Democrats, of women voters, of of even moderate Republicans coming and, and showing that they can come out uh, in a state like this, uh, mm -hmm. in a state that Donald Trump both 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 uh, last last two times by eight points. 
Uh, I think it shows yeah. they can really do, what does that say um, for the national landscape and other battleground states? Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because when you look at Trump, you know, how Trump did, he won that state by about eight points. And um, in every county, we saw that um, this measure, um, un, you know, overperformed or un underperformed his numbers. So right. that shows that there's, you know, some bipartisan uh, support here. Um, it, Democrats definitely see this as a galvanizing issue for them. The question, though, is can they sustain it and does it necessarily translate to support for Democratic candidates? Um, that seems to be a challenge for the party as well, kind of keeping that up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I think, I mean, I think this this was a big question following last year's success. Remember, uh, the Republicans underperformance, underperformance, one of the main reasons it was accredited to uh, was because of the reversal Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking, now we're here in, in, in August, ahead yeah. of this November race, and it's still galvanizing folks. It still has this mm -hmm. power to do that. And really, um, if, you, if you're looking at some of these numbers, that in, in, in some of the, just some of these results show that Republicans are struggling to adjust mm. on how to do that, how to counter that in these states. So I think even though uh, we're, you know, a couple of months from November from that from that mm -hmm. election uh, mm -hmm. where, where that the constitutional amendment will be on the on the mm -hmm. ballot, and again the the, the main uh, election in mm -hmm. a year from that November, yeah. it's still it's still fueling voters to go out to the polls. Yeah, and that's a really good point, too, because, you know, Ohio is probably the only state that will have a ballot measure this year. Right. But next year, other states are working, including Arizona. They're trying to get something on the ballot right. in that big battleground state. And big speaking of state. Arizona yeah. being a big yeah. battleground Eesh. state for the presidential, but also a huge Senate race that we've been talking about for months, uh, looking into that, um, Carrie Lake, Republican who ran for governor, was unsuccessful, but is a Trump acolyte. Um, is kind of putting it out there that she may be running for Senate. Um, that seems to run counter to what Republicans have said about trying to focus on candidate quality. I mean, what kind of impact would that have on the race? I mean, yeah, like you're absolutely, absolutely right. Even NRC chairman uh, uh, Senator Daines basically said that, you know, it, it might be a tough climb, uphill climb for her. Uh, by the way, CHP, she still hasn't said, conceded the, her, her loss, their gubernatorial loss to Katie Hobbs right. from last year. I mean, this is someone who is, who is like the ultra MAGA, uh, you know, candidate in, in, in that state where the McCain Republicans came out and voted for the Democrat against her. I mean, is that really the best candidate that Republicans have to have in that battleground state in a 2024 cycle? And, it's a, and it could be a three-way race, you know, between yeah. Senator Kristen, uh, Kirsten Sinema mm -hmm. uh, running as an independent now, mm -hmm. and, and, and likely uh, Ruben Gallego, the House Democrat, who has been galvanizing progressive and, and youth and Latino voters in that state. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned um, Senator Daines, who chairs the NRSC. He actually sat down with Major Garrett recently. I want to play a little bit of their conversation because it speaks to exactly what you were talking about. You want to make sure you're focused on the future. They don't want to hear about grievances of the past. They want to know what are you going to do to address the problems of this country and looking forward? So Carrie Lake's not someone you would see yourself and the committee supporting? Well, we've, we've had conversations with Carrie. Long she, conversations. She, she, she was said, here. Uh, she sat down with you for several, yeah, yeah. almost we, two we, hours, we had, as I understand. We had, we had a very good discussion about uh, you know, what, what's it mean to win in Arizona and talking about the future, uh, casting. Was she receptive? To, she was. It, it was, a, it was a very robust, it was a good discussion. So he says that she was receptive, but what she's been saying on the trail suggests otherwise. And she's been out there campaigning. I mean, she was in Ohio, for example, campaigning, and she's been out there a lot. Um, this seems like an issue that the party, you know, needs to address, but they're really tiptoeing around it. Right. All signs seem it seems to indicate that she is going to be running uh, and, and is staffing up and, and for a launch in, uh, potentially in October. So I look, I, I think, you know, if she is being receptive, I, I don't know how receptive as you said, she is being to that line of thinking, I think. And you, yeah. as you mentioned, she has been at all these big conservative uh, you know, gatherings throughout the, the cycle. You've seen her mm -hmm. you know, on, on Newsmax and all these other uh, uh, right-wing right yeah. outlets where you know, she, she is speaking to a base that really adheres to that um, yeah. very, you know, very, uh, very MAGA 
base uh, of supporters. Trump is the nominee. Um, you know, she'll be out there a lot. Uh, speaking of if Trump's the nominee, that is kind of the big yeah. question facing a lot of his rivals right. as they're preparing for the debate stage. We've talked a lot about making the debate requirements in terms of polling yeah. and uh, donor thresholds, but there's also a debate qualification that isn't talked about as much, and that's signing this loyalty pledge. And Vivek Ramaswamy, who's, you know, gained some interest among voters, um, has said that he's the only candidate so far that's actually signed that pledge to support the eventual nominee. My question is, how does the RNC actually enforce that um, at all? I mean, is that kind of just a phony pledge at this point? Well, you know, they say that that it has real um, it has a real impact on those who do not sign it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think, um, you know, it's the last of the criteria after they hit the 40,000 unique vote, uh, donors, after they mm -hmm. after they they hit the requiring bowling, uh, polling, st standing in the, in the pollings that they uh, acknowledge, uh, but like, you know, Vivek has signed it, but others have been hesitant or have been very critical of it, including Donald Trump. Mm. Like, you know, Will Hurd has, has, has been critical of it. I don't know if he's going to make through the base stage with that criteria. But others, you know, uh, like Chris Christie, uh, if they don't, uh, if they don't sign it, you're right. Does it have the teeth? to really yeah. stop uh, a candidate, a candidacy in this race? Does it really have the teeth to really dissuade someone? And, and, the, and the fact of the matter is we're still waiting to see if Donald Trump goes to this first debate. It's only right. a couple weeks away. Caitlin. Yeah, and whether he'll sign it. Uh, Chris Christie yeah. has said, you know, and he'll take it as seriously right. as Trump right. did yeah. the last I mean, time just, around. So it kind of speaks to it. But to your point, I mean, the broader question of are these candidates, you know, they're dancing around the idea of whether they would support Trump if he were the nominee. So just a couple weeks to go until that big debate, and we'll see what happens then. Finn it's a Gomez, wild thank cycle, you yeah. so much. Absolutely. Speaking of Donald Trump, he hasn't backed down this week from going on the attack regarding those criminal cases against him. Next, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, who served on the House January 6th committee, will join us to discuss the former president's mounting legal challenges. You're streaming America Decides. He chose to try to stay in office through a multi-part scheme to overturn the results and block the transfer of power. Welcome back to America Decides. Back in December, during its final public hearing, the House January 6th committee unanimously issued four criminal referrals against Donald Trump. Less than a year later, the former president's legal situation looks drastically different. Nevertheless, Trump has remained defiant. California Democratic Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren joins us now. She previously served on the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack. Congresswoman, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your committee's work, because when you read the indictment from Special Counsel Jack Smith, uh, you see a lot of similarities uh, between that and the work that your committee did. What kind of role do you think the committee played in getting to this point? Well, I, I think actually we played a more important role than I understood at the time. Hmm. Uh, we, of course, investigated uh, the plot, uh, and the ex-president was at the center of that multifaceted plot to overturn the election. Uh, we interviewed, uh, you know, over a thousand witnesses, or and uh, I assumed that the Department of Justice was doing the same thing. It turns out they were focusing almost entirely on the foot soldiers, the actual rioters. And it wasn't until we were able to reveal publicly uh, the extent of the plot that went up to the highest office in the land that I think they began looking beyond the foot soldiers themselves. Yeah, I want to ask a little more about that, because earlier this week I spoke to one of your Democratic colleagues, uh, Brendan Boyle, a uh, Democrat from Pennsylvania, and he was very critical of the Justice Department and Attorney General Merrick Garland, Bar Garland saying they didn't move fast enough. I'm wondering if you share some of those criticisms of the Justice Department in terms of the timeline and how they acted here? Well, uh, when Jack Smith was appointed special counsel, things moved uh, rapidly. I, I do wish that the special counsel had been appointed earlier, uh, because all of this could have been uh, earlier than it is now. But that's uh, in the rearview mirror, nothing to be done about it. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what happens next. 
in the court of law. I also want to ask about some news today that we are learning about this uh, special memo from um, one of President Trump's, um, someone in President Trump's uh, circle, um, the secret memo outlining a strategy for uh, former President Trump to overturn Biden's win. Um, and this essentially involved uh, getting a, an alternate slate of electors. I'm wondering if you, if your committee knew about that memo. We knew about some of the memos from Cheeseboro, but not the not the one that's been in the news today. Uh, mm -hmm. We uncovered the plot uh, to have these fake fake electors. It was mm -hmm. uh, went right up to uh, the president himself, and it was illegal. And we made that known in our report, although we didn't have all of the memos. Uh, that are being discussed. We had one from uh, earlier in November and December. And you also have said before, too, that, you know, in the indictment, we learned that Mike Pence, the former vice president, of course, uh, took notes and uh, shared those with the committee. Um, you have said that the committee uh, shared them with the uh, special counsel, I should say. You have said that the committee did not see those notes. Is, is that right? That's right. We were unable to interview uh, Mike Pence. Um, he We subpoenaed him, and he declined to come in. Uh, of course, the special counsel has uh, more tools available than a congressional committee, and he did go in to talk to them. So there are things that we were unable to find out, like his contemporaneous notes. And when uh, President Trump told him, you're too honest, we didn't know that either. But we learned a lot. Uh, from his chief counsel and his chief of staff, uh, and uh, but not everything. In addition to those notes or the existence of them, um, was there anything else that you learned that you didn't know that came forward in this indictment? Well, I didn't know uh, that uh, Trump had told Pence, you're too honest. I mean, that tells me a couple of things. One, that Pence refused to violate his oath, but I guess Trump realized that he was being dishonest in that statement. And number two, I didn't realize how close we came uh, to uh, Trump ordering the military into American cities. That's pretty chilling. Uh, if he had succeeded, there would have been demonstrations. And that's why, quote, we have the Insurrection Act, which, of course, allows for military to be dispatched. Very unsettling. And there, of course, is also this looming case in Georgia. Of course, that's uh, not a federal case, but I'm wondering kind of everything you've seen from the indictment from Jack Smith and also the work that your committee is doing, anything that you may expect to see if charges are, in fact, brought in that case? Well, I don't know what, what the Georgia uh, case is, except what I read in the newspapers. It looks like they are exploring the fake elector issue, which, of course, we also identified. What else they're looking at, uh, you know, I don't know. And, of course, it's violations of uh, state law that they will be pursuing, not the federal statutes that we looked at. Well, Zoe Lofgren, a congresswoman from California and member of that January 6th committee, we thank you very much for your time, and we'll see how these investigations play out. Okay, you take care. And President Biden is set to speak in Utah tomorrow, and that's where the FBI says they shot and killed a man who was posting death threats against the president. We'll update you on the latest next. We're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Law enforcement sources tell CBS News a man who was shot and killed during an FBI raid allegedly posted online death threats against President Biden. The president is set to speak tomorrow in Utah. On social media, the suspect allegedly referenced the president's visit and threatened to dig out camouflage gear and a rifle. CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe joins us now. Ed, what a story. Yeah. President's still going to Utah, but what happened here? What do we know? This man, Craig Robertson, is in his 70s. He lived in Provo, Utah, which is about 45 minutes south of where the president's headed to tonight in Salt Lake City. The FBI had been tracking him for about five months. Mm. Uh, back in March, he made a threat against Alvin Bragg, who is, of course, the Manhattan District Attorney, mm -hmm. on Truth Social, the platform favored and founded 
by former President Donald Trump, saying in part that it was his plan to go to New York and fulfill his dream of killing Bragg, waiting him out in a parking garage and then killing him. Uh, subsequently, FBI agents in Utah uh, were flagged to this. They went to this gentleman's house, observed him later that same day. Uh, as it is described in the 39-page complaint, he was wearing a suit, a white shirt, a red tie, a lapel pin with an AR-15 style rifle, a lapel mm. pin, and a camouflaged uh, Donald Trump hat. They were able to track him over the next few days and then began reviewing his, reviewing his social media on Facebook and other platforms. Mm -hmm. And they found more than two dozen examples of him making threats against the president, mm. the vice president, Alvin Bragg, Letitia James, the New York attorney general, yeah. and then Merrick Garland, of course, the attorney general of the United States. What do those three prosecutors yeah. have in common? Of course, mm -hmm. they're overseeing criminal and civil proceedings against the former president. The yeah. FBI went today to, serve, to arrest him. There was some kind of confrontation. He's now dead. But that happened, of course, hours before the president's supposed to arrive in Utah tonight as mm -hmm. part of this four-day Western state swing that he's on mm -hmm. uh, to, promote, to promote his agenda and to raise money for his reelection campaign. I mean, this just goes to show how, what, you know, these statements that have been made in the political sphere yeah. have real consequences. Yeah. Uh, and people are hearing them and acting, apparently. Um, about to act on that. And one real quick thing that our uh, CBS News consultant, A.T. Smith, who's a former mm, deputy yeah. director of Secret Service, he said, it is often the case that people like this who might have been making threats against the president, the vice president, the first lady, and live in an area where they're about mm -hmm. to go, uh, mm -hmm. may be put under extra surveillance mm -hmm. or may even be arrested uh, because of the more recent threats made against those protectees. So he mm -hmm. said, this happens quite frequently. We don't actually hear about it that often. This yeah. one, however given the volume of his threats made on social media and his interactions with the FBI mm -hmm. agents who had been investigating him, mm -hmm. warranted them moving in today, but unfortunately led to his death. Words have consequences. Um, really quickly, you mentioned uh, why the president is out there to promote this climate change agenda. He actually spoke with our partners at the Weather Channel, and I want to play a little bit of that sound. We've conserved more land. We've moved in. The, we've rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. We passed a $368 billion climate control facility. We're, we're, we're moving. It's the, it is the existential threat to humanity. So you've already declared that national emergency. Practically speaking, yes. Yeah. Okay, so practically speaking means he hasn't. what? He hasn't done it. He's faced pressure from environmental groups, from the left wing of his party, to declare a formal national emergency on climate change, which would allow him under national emergency authority to do a lot more things with executive authority to try mm -hmm. to combat extreme weather. Mm -hmm. uh, hasn't done it under pressure from members of his own party, from Republicans who say they try to block it. Mm -hmm. And of course, if Republicans are trying to block it, there's a chance a handful of moderate Democrats in the House and the Senate would join them in doing so, and it would create mm -hmm. more of a political problem. So he says they yeah. practically have done so through a myriad of things that he's enacted or he's approved. The Inflation Reduction Act, of course, includes a lot of money to mm -hmm. deal with climate change, but it is not mm -hmm. the national emergency that the left wing of his party is pushing for. Ruben mm -hmm. Gallego, for example, mm -hmm. who's running for the U.S. Senate in Arizona, where he did that interview, is among those pushing him to do this, saying it's absolutely necessary. His state, of course, seeing record heat this summer. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't he push to do that? Mm -hmm. The president of to our friend uh, Stephanie Abrams at the Weather Channel, trying to make it seem as if he's done it, but he hasn't. Yeah. The White House not happy that this has become the focus of the trip. That also mm -hmm. included conversation about uh, the other economic legislation passed and then tomorrow a veterans bill that was passed a year ago this week. And that pressure for the left flank, um, you know, you need that enthusiasm right. for uh, your reelection bid. Ed O'Keefe, thank you very much. Thank you for watching. And that does, us, does it for us today. You can stream America Designs Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.